Today is April 28th, and this is a 2015 Facilities Geospatial Technology Showcase. This six-month webinar series is hosted by the Campus Facilities Technology Association and organized by the University of Kentucky. I'm Michelle Ellington, and thank you to all attendees joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and slides will be made available on the CFTA website. The presentation is estimated to run 45 minutes, with the remaining time dedicated for Q&A. Feel free to send any questions during the presentation using the questions dialog box. Your question will be added to the queue and answered at the end or as time allows. I want to extend a special thank you to today's presenter, Tom McCaffrey. Tom serves as the Director of GIS and Records Management for the University of Calgary, Alberta. He will be presenting on maximizing the strength of GIS in facilities. Tom, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So. Um, Today, I'd, I'd like to start off with uh, thanking Michelle Ellington and her team at the University of Kentucky for all the work they've done putting these webinars together. Um, we up here at the University of Calgary have found them very helpful, especially in areas that we haven't uh, gone yet where we want to see what's going on in the future and what other universities have done. So thank you very much, Michelle. Today's uh, presentation is going to start with uh, what we're doing here at the University of Calgary. So for our agenda, we've got I'm going to discuss what a little bit about the University of Calgary, how we grow our data sets, how we use our data, and then what we do with it as far as building data systems, the quality control that goes in with some of this, and then some of our future plans. And then we'll follow it up with the questions at the end. This will be a full 45-minute presentation. Hopefully it doesn't go much longer than that, but uh, I'll do the best I can with this. The uh, the University of Calgary is loaded at, located in Western Canada in a province called Alberta in a city called Calgary. And we have a large area for our campus and it's broken up in, in different little sub-campuses. So we have our medical campus, we have our football stadium, we have a campus downtown as well as some other locations. The fast facts about our university are there's 31,000 students, we have 2,900 administrative staff, 1,800 faculty staff. We have 14 different faculties at this university and we occupy 416 acres. There's over 110 buildings that we have to deal with in facilities which occupy 10 million square feet of interior space. And we're known for the 1988 Winter Olympics. Our university not only housed the uh, opening and closing ceremonies at our stadium, but we housed all the students, uh, or not students, the athletes that were in the uh, Olympics as well as we had a speed skating facility here as well. So UC Maps, which stands for University Centralized Map Services, is about 15 years old. It started 12 years ago and we were in the information technology side. It was one person and it went to uh, one person with one computer on the desk. So we grew from that and moved to facilities the last three years and we had three people with a full enterprise system with a production backup and development with both the servers and their databases. So we've, we've grown quite a bit in the last three years and it's really helped us expand to where we're going. We're not a large group and we don't have a lot of money and so I'm going to try to show how we developed all the things that we have here on kind of a shoestring budget. The software that we use is we have a building management system called Archibus and then primarily we use uh, our GIS uh, product which is Esri. In uh, 2012 Esri had an article written about our university called Building a University of the Future. It was in their 2012 winter edition in ARC News and it gave sort of a, a blueprint of the direction that we were going. So now being 2015, I'm going to try to discuss a little bit about where we're at and how we got there. Again, I want to iterate here that it doesn't take a lot of money or a lot of people to get started. It just takes a little bit of creativity and how you're going to deal with some of the issues that you're going to run into. So growing our data sets, what we did is we purchased a LiDAR data set for our campus where we flew over our campus. We gathered 3 million points that gave us a lot of information related to our campus. The 0.75 meter spread 
was a 50% overlap and it shows the density on the building. So you can sort of really see a picture just from all of the points that you get from, from this data. The second thing that we did is we had a LIDAR image that we used uh, in, in conjunction with an aerial photo that we had purchased. So we had a company fly over our campus. They flew 56 images at high resolution. So we had detail right down to about six inches that we could see as far as uh, objects on, on the surface. And then we used our own resources, our, our engineering departments, geomatics departments, students to help compile this data and make a true ortho-rectified imagery of, of our campus. So now we take our imagery and we, from that we generated our base maps. Our base maps uh, are accurate, they're geo-referenced because we had geo-referenced um, the, the LIDAR and our air photos combined with some ground surveys that we had as well. So we're pretty confident that everything we have is in the right spatial orientation. So now we start generating data from that. First thing we generated was our base map, then we gathered all of our interior buildings, our CAD drawings from our archibus, and we continued converting those in fit into our GIS model. So to this point, we really only have four data sets, two that were purchased and one that was transformed and then one that was generated from the photos. It's from these four data sets that everything you're going to see here today primarily uh, deals with what, what we've been doing here at the University of Calgary. So the first thing that we wanted to do is generate some 3D models. So using our LiDAR, we had hillshade models. This started to give us a quick overview of things that we needed to know about our campus. Uh, when this area over here was built with this building, we piled up all of our dirt over here and we could see uh, what we have to deal with later on in the future. It, it gave us a lot of information about our buildings. The other thing it allowed us to do is create contours. So we took our LiDAR and we generated a, a layer of contours. So now we've now generated another data set from the data sets we started with. This we use later on and I'll show you how we apply that. The generation of our LiDAR helped us create uh, digital surface models and we built all of the campus structures that we needed. We calculated them and gathered the building heights so that we could start generating other information. So now we have heights, we have contours, we generated some subsurface models just by locating uh, things that we had on our campus like our sewers, our manholes, our drainage basins. And then we added our CAD drawings. And combining our CAD drawings, it allowed us to add our LiDAR, our data, our CAD drawings, and create 3D art scene models, which were realistic. We tried not to go to the extent where the, the, the faces of the buildings look realistic. We wanted them to look different because a lot of our buildings are joined together and it's really difficult if the buildings all look the same to identify when you've left one building and entered another one. So this was done by design. It's, it's, Google has done a good job on allowing people to see things in full so we just chose to go the other way. Because this is an arc scene it also allows us the opportunity to run queries on our data and get specific information as we need it. We generated catch basin models by gathering the catch basins from the air photos and putting this data into our base maps and our geo database systems. We also did the same with our irrigation models where we had some CAD drawings of our irrigations but we couldn't use them in the GIS aspect so we had to convert them and put them into the GIS database. We also did the same with the electrical. So at this stage, all we've been doing is growing our data sets, gathering data, and entering them into our geo database. We also did the same with our trees, where we took our photos. We intentionally flew our photos in a leaf off season so that we could see the trees. And I'll show you why we did that in one second. And we applied uh, locations to where all these trees were so that we now have a, a good inventory of where all of our trees are. How did we use this data? Well, let's go back through the sequence again. In our 3D models, what we did is we exported some of this out to um, SketchUp and it allowed us to create these 
3D shadow models. When we were building a new building right in the middle of our campus, we wanted to understand whether we wanted to go with a, a glass face building or whether we wanted to have a solid building. And it would be dependent on how much sun we were getting on this building in the summer solstice and the winter solstice. So by generating these models, it allowed us to see what was uh, affecting this building. We also built these in such a way that we could model them, and here is an example of the shadows of the sun moving through the sky at the same elevation of what we would have. We did this for both the summer and the winter solstice. The SketchUp models that we gathered from that allowed us to see the buildings in the SketchUp format, which is just another look and feel, but it also allowed us to go inside the buildings and see the viewscapes. How does putting a building in a certain place affect the view of another building? What, what are you going to see, etc.? So again, it's part of the planning and the modeling of what we wanted to do here at this university and get a full view and idea of what was going on before it uh, got built. We also dealt with the space allocation maps. So we would take a building and create a 3D model of it, making it transparent. The red squares here represented our elevator shafts, and the yellow squares represented the math faculty and how they're distributed within the building. So we could get a better visualization of keeping our faculties together rather than trying to distribute them over several buildings or across several floors. We used the 3D modeling to generate wayfinding maps that we would have at the first floor of a building. So people going up would look for areas. Sometimes we would have like a human computer interaction lab, which would be an area that a lot of people would go to, or our IT help desk. So these areas get highlighted on the map because of their frequency of use. We would take our 3D models and we would build fly-throughs. and We would use them for student recruitment and campus planning. We could see the campus in a realistic form that we built. We would also build the fly-throughs in such a way that we could represent uh, distances from our main campus to, say, our football stadium. At times, we'll actually rent out this facility, and uh, there may be a rock concert or something there, and people may want to get a good look and feel of what it's like. And we could do that as well as by using our scene, we could highlight and represent different things on here depending on what it was that we were trying to show. So this was a good, uh, good tool that we had. This has been in existence here now for about nine years that we've used. So um, it's really come a long ways uh, for, for helping us understand the different aspects of our, our campus and how that part of it works. The catch basins that we did earlier, you saw, what we would do to apply these is we would take our data and then we would, uh, our air photos, we would find our catch basins and we'd mark them and we'd overlay our CAD drawings to make sure that we had the right uh, lines in place. So with the drainage basins in this example, we also overlaid our contours. You could see um, how we had them all distributed across our campus. How we would apply that is once we converted our CAD drawings into GIS and we aligned everything and we laid our contours in place, you could see in a parking lot that we have here, this is a really good example of a, a very good functioning drainage system where there's a catch basin right in the center of all the contours and this is a really good example. So when it's raining, this parking lot doesn't hold water at all. The parking lot across the street is not quite as good but it still has the proper slope to it and it does manage to deal with it. The parking lot next to that one, it doesn't have any drainage basins and it becomes a real mess when it rains. And so when we could see stuff like this, it would allow us to actually plan and move forward with what we wanted to do for the development in the next fiscal year. The irrigation models, the same would apply to this, is we would take our model from our CAD drawings, and now that we have it in a form that we can use the GIS, we'd be able to isolate different zones. If we had somebody that was doing a dig and they actually broke one of our pipes, we could now see the area that was isolated and how it was affected, and we would be able to understand from the valves what we had to do to shut it off so that we wouldn't have a flooding situation. We also gathered all the data that we would have on our sprinkler head. So in this situation, by knowing the specifications of all the different sprinkler heads and what their ranges were for their, their, their sprinkling, we could 
actually determine areas that were underwatered, and we could also look at areas that we were overwatering. And so we could now adjust what we were doing in the field and manage better our use of water. That applies to the sustainability side when quite often we end up watering either the road or the sidewalks or whatever. So by doing an intersection with our sidewalks, now it's clear which sprinkler heads we need to go to, which ones are causing um, or are not functioning the way that we want them to and allow us to make the corrections that are needed. The same would apply if we brought in the 3D aspect. So we have a, a road turnaround here that comes onto an overpass. So there's a bit of a valley in here and it allows us to determine what's going to happen when we turn the sprinklers on and how's gravity going to affect. A lot of this water might run down into the middle and we could create more of a flooding situation than what the intended use of irrigating the land would be. The electrical system, the same situation would apply here in using this data is we would take our data from our electrical system, from our CAD, and we convert it into a GIS format. Now because we have it broken down, we can add all the attributes. We know which systems are on which breakers, how a unit is in relation to another unit, and so on. So when we start dealing with this kind of information, we could take things like different programs. We had a safety walk program and we also had an LED conversion program. So we converted all of our campus recently from regular lights to an LED conversion so we would save money on electricity. But in order to do that, we wanted to combine the two programs to see that we were going to maximize um, our efforts. And, and we wanted to create a, a worry-free environment with low personal risk to our students and staff. So we generated this map here showing all of the sidewalks. We highlighted them in red. Then we went and added all of the light standards and we gathered this information from what we had in our CAD drawings as well as we confirmed it through our air photos. We figured out what type of light standards were and what the illumination range was and put the associated buffers around them over top of our lights and intersecting with our sidewalks. So by creating the intersection of these, we now can see the areas that do not have the proper lighting. So when we did our, our refit of LED conversions, we not only changed our lights to LEDs, but we also added lights in areas that we felt needed a little bit more security. And now we have a very bright, vibrant uh, walking system at night that our students feel very safe in, in maneuvering and being able to see what's ahead of them. The vegetation models. As you saw earlier, we used the photos to find our trees. Once we did that and had our XY coordinates for all our trees, we brought it, our LIDAR back in and we placed the LIDAR over the bare earth surface. The bare earth surface is the actual ground. It doesn't include any kind of elevation. And it allowed us to extract from the LIDAR the lowest point on the tree. Then we brought in the full feature elevations, which is all of the features that are above the ground, so that would be buildings, cars, trees, etc. And we put the same points over top. We put a one meter buffer around and we extracted the highest point within the one meter buffer to assure that we were getting as close to the top of the canopy as we could. By subtracting the top from the bottom, we ended up with tree elevation. We also went around and calculated out the different tree species. So we could now see the species that we knew. We didn't get them all and uh, sometimes we have to go back and figure out which ones are which. This is where using the help that we have here on campus, our, our, our workers, they get involved and we would give them a system that would allow them to go out there. We would generate these high resolution books and they could see what the different types were. So if they were having a slow period or in the winter, if it wasn't snowing and they weren't busy doing the snow removal, they could actually go around and help clean up the inventory of what we have. And if we had it right, that would be good. If it was wrong, they could change it. And if it was unknown, they could try to find out what it was. And the more that they did with this, the stronger our data sets got. They started to take enormous pride in what was going on and it helped us fill our data sets. Uh, and it, it, this applied to the electrical, the, the vegetation, any area that we worked with, we started to get buy-in, which was absolutely critical in part of our quality control. The part about where we got the tree elevation comes back to when we did our 3D modeling, where we could actually go through the uh, 
fly-throughs, now not only do we have detailed buildings as far as windows and, and heights um, because of our CAD drawings, we also have the elevation heights of our trees. So when we're modeling stuff, we're seeing the model with the actual heights, with the actual species, and it really allows us to play with this in such a way that we can plan things um, for the future. We can add trees that don't exist, we can set, track trees or buildings, and we can plan and model before we even get started on the actual construction. The drainage basin, this project sort of came into play uh, a little while ago, but it was, um, its value was, was important when we started to realize things happen like the UCLA where their main water mains broke and you had uncontrollable water going everywhere. So we had to understand, okay, if that's going to happen to us, we have to understand how's it going to affect our campus and how's it going to affect the people around us because we are a community and we have the responsibility not only of our own land but what we do to people and how we affect the people around us. So as you can see by this picture on the left, we're on the pinnacle of three different drainage basins. So depending on where an incident may or may not happen, we've now narrowed down what we have to deal with by 30% or 66% because only 30% of it is going to be that area. The drainage for each area was then calculated using the ESRI tools to which way the flow is going to go. So we would get a rough idea on a large volume flow when the water is just flying out of here, where is it going to go and who's it going to affect? And then we can start setting up our, our health and safety and security and opening and closing roads and whatever we have to do to try to resolve our problems. The next thing is to build micro basins. So within each basin are little micro basins. And these were important to understand in the event that there might be an oil spill or some kind of minor local problem that would occur but we needed to know that we, is it going to flow? Which way is it going to flow? How fast is it going to flow? We, is it going to get to the sewers that go into our rivers? If it is, we have to block those off. So this gives us a, a quick look at planning how things might work. By generating the flow accumulations, we could see how fast things are going to flow. So as you can see on this picture on the left here, these little reddy, blue, purpley lines indicate the speed at which it flows. And those, of course, when you look at it in a 3D form, are areas of steep slope. So if you're in these areas, it's going to really take off and flow, and it allows us to plan. If it's on a flatter area, we might have a little bit more time to deal with the issues at hand, but at least we understand what the issues at hand are. So the planning and costing of the GIS and what we deal with here is we have to understand our area. We have to understand how much we have of certain things. And just gathering this information from the GIS, we can see that we had 63 acres of parking. We have 67 acres of building footprints. We have more building footprints in area than we do actual parking. And we have 334 acres of grass. So by understanding this, we can then calculate what's the percentage of areas that we have for land cover surface. So roughly 10% of our campus is, is covered in buildings. Roughly 25% is a hard surface, a parking lot, a sidewalk, a road, some form like that. And then the rest of it, which is 65%, is going to be the grass areas. So knowing that when we're doing our budgeting and planning, how much time do we spend in areas? How do we allocate our service levels? So a level one service would be an area that we would go to on a daily basis. It might be the front entrance to a building, make sure that they're clean, that they're safe, there's no ice, the garbage is picked up so that we have a good look and feel on our campus. We're really proud of what we have here, and we really try to, our best to take care of it. A level two or three might be a weekly lawn mowing for a soccer field or something like that. And when we get to our level six areas, that's where our wild grasses are growing. That's our area of future development. So we really don't spend a lot of time there, but we will go out there and check it on a, a regular basis. Uh, with our snow removals, because we have our road networks and everything, we can actually build a priority list. Which roads are most important that have to get plowed first, and then we go to the second and third. Same applies to our sidewalk routing with our sweepers. Uh, if it's a weekend, there might only be three sweepers on duty, so we have to have a different route system than we would have if it was during the weekday when there might be four. 
So that depending on what's going on, uh, people could quickly gather this information, figure out what they have to do, and away we go. Our health and safety people, they deal with the contain areas. Depending on what the incident is, it might be a 50 meter buffer, it might be a 200 meter buffer. So this is just a general map that gets used, uh, giving people a certain idea of, of what they need to know. Same with the security where our help phones are. Uh, we originally did this map several years back, showing where our help phones were and how they're related to different areas. So some areas we need help phones, other areas we probably don't need as many. So by having this laid out, we could quickly see a 100 meter or 100 foot buffer around uh, each phone and what is available. So we, we recognize that some buildings don't have phones and some buildings had more than their share of phones. So we've changed and we've got our distribution and we're fairly happy with what we've got set up now. Same with our security cameras. I can't show you everything on our camp campus for obvious reasons, but I can show you this area because we've actually knocked down these buildings. This is what we had at one point. The camera would build a view shed model. This is using the LiDAR, this is using the Esri products, and we could actually see everything that's in green is what the camera can see. Everything that's in pink, the camera cannot see. So when we looked at, at these images over here on the left, we can see this row of trees, and you can see how the camera can actually see through the trees, but there's certain areas that it can't detect. So it helps us better understand our usage of cameras, how many cameras we need, where we have to have them to make things better. Our telecom is also the same. Uh, we do schematic drawings showing our redundancy in our fibers. Uh, we use the, the GIS to show where to mount antennas outside so that we could get the best coverage for our students when they're out on the lawns in the summer and they got their wireless laptops. The same applied when we were indoors and we were taking the uh, antennas and we build a model, see if we have the right number of antennas. If we don't, then we have to get more and we can do all of this just using the computer without even going in. We use it to count telephones so that we can locate orphan telephone lines and, and reduce costs of having lines in areas that aren't even being used or find areas that should have phones that they might show up as a zero these ones that have 63 and 71, these are our testing areas, and so they just keep giving the same room number to the system, even though they don't really have that many phones in there. From administrative use, this is how we did some of our budgeting to get funding for major uh, jobs that we had, like in IT. We had to switch some of our computer systems. So we went around our campus and we put a rating on each building for what we felt the riser system for that building is. Is that riser system in good shape or poor shape or medium shape? And then we did the same with the switches, the backbones, the cables. These are all the components that comprise the network system. So by putting them together and then running them through an indexing system, we created what is a network building health index. So we could see at a glance which buildings were in better shape than others, and then we would apply knowledge knowing that this is a research building and this building needs uh, more attention paid to it. So that helped us pick our pri priorities. There were millions of dollars spent on this project and it was all based on the fact that we could give them this information up front and they could understand what they were looking at. When we were looking at the study spaces on our campus, we put this model together with all our campus campuses. Hello? We can still see you, Tom. Yeah, okay. I'm just trying to go back to where I was here. I don't know what yep. happened there. Sorry about that. Take your time. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting back to... All right. Let me okay. just go back. There we go. So with our study spaces, we looked at all the areas that were open to the general public and the private and we could see that we had a fair number of them. The private ones are areas that would be like a, a, a works uh, engineering that only the engineering students could go in there, something along that line. Then we looked at the noise levels of these areas and tried to put a value on whether these areas were distracted study spaces or they were study spaces. It helped us get a better understanding and then we went forward and created more study spaces for our students 
that allowed them uh, better areas to go and, and do the work they did. We applied the work, work request costs and um, what we did is we took all our work requests out of the Archibus and we had the actual cost. I, I'm not going to show that here, but I am showing you the quantities of work requests. So some buildings may have a, lo a large quantity of work, uh, work requests, but they might be simple things like cleaning up washrooms and things like that. Whereas if you're in the hospital and you're doing the same, you're dealing with different type of equipment, it's stainless steel, it's going to cost more. So the costs are different based on, on that aspect. We could break that down and show it on a per room basis as to where all of these work requests are going. So from the maintenance side of things, it really allowed us a strong view of what was going on um, with our work requests. We could do this over time as well. So we could take 2010, 11, 12. As you could see, the good news here is the work requests were going up and up as time went on, and that is because our our people were buying into this. They were using our Archibus system more. They were trusting it more. The GIS was giving them the information they need. All in all, it was it was working quite good for us. So the building of the data systems, one of the systems we built is a roofing asset management system. So this allowed us to check our roofs and look at, at the different roofs that we have available. And we could turn on, this is an actual web application that we have that's available to our workers, so they can go onto this anytime, see what the roofs are. They could go and click on a specific roof, find out the, the years of life expectancy out of that roof, who the contractor was, when the warranty expires. This is critical because if we could actually find some, uh, a roof is starting to fail before the warranty and get it replaced while it's under warranty, this potentially could save this university millions of dollars. Uh, when we're doing our planning, we convert the roofing map to years of installation. So we can see what year they were installed and we color them based in decades. So the ones that were done in purple were done in the 60s. If there's a 40-year life expectancy, those ones are probably due for repair and, and replacement. But we can also look at them and see what state are they in. Might not replace if it's still in excellent shape. So it gives us time to plan around which ones are in, in which order and what is the priority. Using the air photos and going on a year-to-year -year basis, we can actually look at the assets on our roof. We can zoom right down and see air conditioning or, or tie-downs or venting units. We can go on a year-to-year -year basis for a building. We did this with our government um, where we get our funding from because they want to see if they're going to give us millions of dollars to re-roof. They can actually see us in the process of re-roofing these things, and they're very comfortable that we're actually using this money in the appropriate manner, and they're more willing to give us money the following year. We can take the campus and we can view um, year to year the development of a new building. So, boom, pops up a new building. As we start going year to year, we can see how it's, it's coming along. We created different things like the evacuation range finder. This is jumping, sorry, I'm jumping around as much as I am, but this is for the security people. So in the event that there was something going on and we had an incident and we wanted to know what, what do we do, this system is available where we could click on a building and it would come up with the information, it would show us a buffer. It's pretty important where you could click on here and say, give me everything within 100 meters and you see there's 11 buildings and which ones they are. The more important thing is that if it's a building on the edge of your campus, you want to see how it's going to apply to the surrounding community. Does it affect the community? Is it in the industrial? Is it in the residential? Is it taking out the, the train? Is that part of it? Main road networks. So from that perspective, um, it works out. So we could actually go into it. This is a live presentation. If I pick, pick a building and click on it, I have my system up here set at 20 meters. It'll come back and say there's five buildings. It tells me what these five buildings are. I can send my resources to go evacuate those buildings and I feel comfortable that I'm doing it to code. I've got the right people going to the right buildings. I'm not wasting my resources. If I change this to 200 meters and I come over here and I pick a different building, boom, there it comes up. I've got 21 buildings. I can scroll through here, make sure that everybody's getting to the right buildings and away we go. That part of it is uh, how we use just a simple application of finding our, our data. 
The uh, interactive room finder is one that we did years ago and it is just escalated beyond our own imaginations as to how well it's used. In this case here, it was originally designed to help students find their classes. We've got 32,000 rooms on our campus and it's obvious that that makes it difficult for people to find. So you would find the building that you're interested in, you would enter the room number and the room finder will come back and show you where that building is and, and how it works or, or how you would get to it. So again with our, our demo, we have our interactive room finder here. What we found by doing this is, yes, it was really cool. You'd pick something like the dining center. We'd say, let's go to room 105. It zooms right in. It brings up all the information on our floor. And now you can say, OK, I know how to get to room 105. You can move this around just like you would anything else. It's got a little bit of a lag on the refresh. But the important thing was our workers quickly discovered that, oh, i got to go do a bunch of work. It's going to be really noisy in room 105. And there, if this was another building that was a teaching facility, they would say, well, who am I going to affect that's below me? I'm going to be using a jackhammer. So they just switched this to the basement floor. And now I can see the basement floor with the outlay of the current floor that I'm going to be doing my work in. And I can go find the, the different owners of these and say, listen, you know, on Wednesday we're going to be doing this work. You just might be aware that it's going to be loud. The same would apply if I want to see who's above me. I'd go to the second floor and I'd turn that on. Well, in this case, it's only a one-story building, so there's nobody above me, so I don't have to worry about it. So all in all, even though it was designed to help find the room finder, um, to find rooms, it allows us to get information on these rooms. We have two systems. One is for the general public. It doesn't tell you much other than where the room is and what the area is. The other one that we have is going to give a lot more information that comes out of our Archibus system that will allow people to find out what the room is, what's in the room, what it's used for, and so on. Is it used a lot? Since 2010, we've had 2.6 million people use this. They've come from all around the world. The large 63% of them are returning. It also gives us information like who are your users? Who's looking at our university? And who do we want to market to get more students and professors here? So we can see that Canada is the number one, which is obvious. It's likely Calgary if you broke it down even further. Then you got the United States, India. Then you got the local wireless, which is also going to be Canada. Then you've got uh, the UK, Iran, and so on. So it's a really good tool for our upper management to understand who's, who's looking at our university and what are their interests with this university. The Pathfinder system here is a system that allows the uh, uh, user to find they want to go from point A to B. So we built all these networks in the 3D world. And if you take the skins off the buildings, you can see that there's, there's stairwells, there's everything that you would ever have, hallways. And the web interface would allow you to say, get off the train and you want to come over to a classroom. How would I do that? It allowed you to determine whether you're going to go indoors or outdoors. If it's raining, you might walk indoors only. Uh, if it's a nice day, you might go outside. If you're handicapped and you're, you can't do stairs because you're in a wheelchair, then you want to avoid stairs. It will do all of those things as, as it goes along. Our utility finder allows us to see our utilities. You would, you would click on a utility and get information about it. Is that pipe metallic? Is it concrete? Uh, any information that we could have about that, we could get gas lines, water lines, storm lines. So when we're doing digs on our campus, We've now implemented all this information and ground truth it as best as we could. We built in uh, chilled water, for example, as in our, our tunnel systems. We can actually see what the flow is and what the flow is like if we shut something off. So now we can see how we're going to have to reroute something if we have to do some work on a pipe one day. Same applies to our irrigation system. We break it down into units based on the system and how it's controlled by different controllers. Uh, we can change the backdrops on this so we can actually see what trees are we actually nearest and how are we watering them, or we can go to a grayscale because we want to see more of the schematic scheme. We can click on items and get information down here. Is it, pi is it plastic pipe? Is it metal? We could find out all the sprinkler heads. If we had to replace our system, which we're going to have to do soon, we can actually do all the calculations of what it's going to cost and, and how we're going to do it. With our electric system, we have the same kind of scenario where you can click on your lines, you can check your circuit panels. Our tree management, I've already shown this a little bit where we can actually see the trees. 
the users can go in and actually change this. They just click on it, it'll come up with a menu. If it's not a crab apple tree, if it's a pine tree, they just select from their menu pine tree and it changes it. Our quality control, one of the things we're using GIS for is correcting room number issues. In this example here, we have the room numbers in a numerical order. As a young child, you used to do the connect the dots and you'd end up with a picture of a dragon or something. In this situation, we can connect the dots and we can look for errors. So when you have an area that's sort of a, a suite, this example here would be 201 A, B, C. The red line will connect the suites. The starburst is the centroid to that suite. And then when we add the connect the dots, we can see that this floor is actually numbered very well with this exception here because this line jumps across. So we go see 215, we realize that that's actually just a, a, a clerical error and we have to fix it. Same with over here. Anytime you get crossings, there's going to be an error. This was all done in Python. It's programmed into the GIS and it runs automatically. We can do our entire campus using this system. Again, you can see the obvious ones here that jump out that are wrong because they're, you shouldn't have lines jumping all the way across campus. This floor here is another really good example. We have all of the odds and evens based on light and dark colors, so you can see they're all clustered together, but there's two that are way out of place. So we would go and try to fix those the next time we're doing renovations in that area. Our best example of a worst example is this one, in such a way that the rooms are like a checkerboard, their odds and evens aren't together, They're, it's all mixed up, we've got things going north, south, east, west. So this one clearly needs attention and it needs it from the basis of how do people find their way around as well as health and safety and uh, emergency response. These are all factors. When we make changes on our system, we have run uh, computer systems that actually check what was there before and what's there now and we can detect what's changed. So we can actually monitor month to month how many things have changed and where they've changed. When we're verifying our data, we go into our, our systems here. We went and put markers in our tunnels that show us where we are and then we run a chilled water system through there and we originally put our CAD system in there and then we went and added a video system to it. So we can actually see that at marker 1108, there's a water valve right here and it follows everything that we thought. We can go to this at any time and see what it is. In this case here, everything that's highlighted in pink actually exists and the ones that in blue are actually errors in our data that don't exist. So we've done a huge cleanup of our data control and it's allowed us to um, have a better system. When we link it on our web system, this is something that we're currently working on, is we could go into our, our, our system and, and we could look at a, a pipe. We could click on a pipe and we could get different areas. So we had contracted a company to come in and do a utility assessment on our sewers and we could see different areas of information that they found. When we go into our system, we can mark each one now based on critical risk of failure. Are these areas going to fail? Is this an area we need to spend money on right now or can this wait till next year's budget? So by planning this across the system, it was a real helpful tool for us to do it. Putting it on the web allows us to actually show where the failures are. We can click on it and bring up either the video or we could bring up a JPEG of what the area is and what the problems are. So the planning of this is really critical. Our future plans that we would like to do at this university is we'd like to fully automate our network system. So we would like it so that we, the GIS people, will build these things based on the needs and requirements of our end users, but they have to go in and edit the attributes and in time they'll be able to edit their, their own vectors. If they move the irrigation pipeline, they should be able to edit it. So we're trying to make it simple. We're trying to make it mobile based and we also would like to get into a remotely sensed data collection so we could have sensors out there that are real time that will tell us what we need to do. And we're working on that with some of our electrical systems so we could actually see if a wire is live or not. Um, there's lots of ramifications that go with that so that's going to take a little bit of time. If we had a dashboard interface for our utility usage, that's also where the remotely sensed data collection would come in. We would also like to in the next year or so integrate our record system so that if you went to a room you would actually click on the room and you could get all the documents related to that spatial area. You could get uh, the electrical or the plumbing or the mechanical. If it was 
a type of document that you could overlay it, we would actually see the overlay and we could do the project manage. I know that this is very similar to what the BIM system is doing, and, but this is just something that we've tried to work in with all of our old archived data and so on. And that is the end of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was phenomenal. I, I, I want to know, when do you sleep? <laughs> that is, that, when did you start working in building the GIS at Calgary? We started 15 years ago, and the first 12 years, as I mentioned, were under the umbrella of the uh, IT group. And then once we got things rolling, we felt that it, it was time to move it over to the facilities because there was just so much potential in what we could do with that. And how many are the core developers um, in your staff, or you know, who's been the contributors over the years? We, we've hired a lot of students. We take advantage of the fact that we have a, a, a large quantity of students here that want to work and that are really intelligent. So we'll get summer students that will do a lot of the legwork and a lot of the busy work. But as far as full-time uh, programmers, we had one part for a little while in the first 12 years, and then we've got uh, two of them now. So it's, it's, you have to have that. It's critical. If you don't have it, then you have to find a way that you can use students or somebody that's available to you, even if it is lower priced help. You need to have that kind of thing to move forward here. And what departments do you collaborate with that um, you know, are, are feeding you data that needs to be updated and maintained? Well, anytime we do stuff like air photos, we try to totally engage somebody like our geomatics engineering group where they actually can do the surveying and the testing and they can they can help us. What they get out of this and what we get out of it sometimes are completely different, but it's a win-win situation. So uh, we, our geography department is strong in helping us with some of the vegetation and, and things like that. And then we have the whole other side where we just help the academic research as well, but that wasn't part of this facilities presentation. Can you think of any of you like your standout projects that you've seen the biggest return of investment? Well, the biggest return of investment as far as time saving was that room finder, without any question. I, I know that people look at the 9-11 situation and say, well, how can you put all that data out there? Well, the glass is either half full or half empty, and almost all of this data is available. Our campus is open all the time. People could come around and look if they wanted to, so we figured let's help the people that are here as much as we can, and then we'll build a strong security system if we ever have issues, we'll deal with it with our strong systems. So it, it, it's proven to be very strong. It started out for the students, but it's just gone everywhere now. So we have grandma and granddad that are coming to convocation. We've got everyone using this that are, you know, people are renting facilities here for weddings. Um, we've got the professors trying to find meetings rooms. And then we've got all the facilities people who continually use this with 32,000 rooms. It can't be expected. They're going to find them. Uh, someone asked specifically, uh, Christy Eakins, she asked you know, if you've ever had you know, a particular issue releasing the room finding data to, to the public. Anything stand out to you? No, the, what we did is we made sure that we don't tell you what these rooms are. Uh, if you look at our, our system, it's just going to show that it's a room. So okay. if a person really wanted to know and they went walking and there was a window, they could look in and see it. But you can't stop that and you, you shouldn't really fear that completely. So we embrace the fact that, uh, that our, our campus wants to help become a better campus and, and we've gone with this and it hasn't been a problem, knock on wood, and um, it's, it, we had buy-in from our administration and, and it's, it's been very productive. So the time saved when you put a dollar value on students' times or the interruptions that are caused in classrooms when students are showing up late or meetings in general um, has been astronomical. So the benefit has outweighed the risk. Good. Very good to hear. Um, Graham Smith asks, if um, is the building floor plan your own data model, or did you use another like BISDOM or FISDOM? No, this is everything that we have we've created here, and for the most part, everything was created inside the Esri product line. And what tools are you using for your web applications? This is a question comes from Maria Martinez. Uh, yeah, what tools are you using? And are you using Google Maps, APIs, or Esri? And what did 
you use? Did you use one tool versus another? Yeah. Well, we're currently switching to the Esri API systems, but we used to use the .NET system. Um, now things are changing, so we have to change with it. Um, it's, it's pretty basic. We're trying to keep it simple, and there's, there's nothing special to what we've been doing. Any, any real details on that that anyone wants to know more details, please feel free to contact me, and, uh, and we can... Uh, my email is on the on this page that's up there right now. We can answer it in, in more detail. I have a question from um, Haritha. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce your last name. Um, it's, it's about understanding the spaces slide, and, and I think they have a really good point. They say, how do you stack your floor plans in a building to pick rooms on all floors, you know, in a 2D view? Uh, if she's making reference to the, the 3D model where we had the math science one, we understand... Understanding study spaces is, your, is the slide. Oh, the, the, okay, so the study spaces, every room that we have in our Archibus system is allocated a use. It may be a hallway, it may be a study space, it may be a lab or a lecture theater, and so we have them all labeled out like that. So for us to just do a query and find areas that were study spaces and hallways or study spaces period, we could actually do that. And we would get a list of them and then we'd just do the query on it. And then with the three, 3D model, because we're doing stuff in our scene, we could also do the queries that would change them and light them up accordingly. Yeah, and I think the answer is there's really not necessarily a great way to do it right now. I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there, but hopefully the technology will continue to adapt to meet those needs. Yeah, this, this particular one wasn't an easy thing to build, but the end result was very beneficial for us to actually see. Uh, you, if you have people saying something, you know, isn't adequate or you need more space and you actually need to see what they're talking about, we saw that, we adapted to it, and, and we corrected the deficiencies. Now, Daniel Ford from Minnesota asks, um, assuming you still use AutoCAD and other non-GIS tools and data on campus, how do you keep those non-GIS data up to date and in sync with your GIS system? Well, for the most part, everything that comes into our systems is coming in in a CAD form. And so everything that's living within our Archibus system is data that relates to the, the CAD. It's, it's when we take those CAD drawings and we convert them over to our geo, spatial geo database that we then link back to the uh, Archibus system, we're sharing the same attribute. We have the same building, floor, room model that they have. Everything is lined up the same. One is salt, one is pepper. That's the only difference. They're, just, they're different things, but they both use from the same database. So for us to grab data, if it's changed, whether it's changed through the CAD system or whether it's changed through the GIS system, there is only one system. And so everybody benefits that single source. Now, is your roofing data in Archibus? This, this question is from Christy Eakins. Is your roofing data in Archibus? Uh, yes. It, it, uh, it's based on, we, we can put in Archibus what we had to do with, with part of our Archibus system um, for that particular, or for the way we have it set up, it didn't know how to handle roofs, so we created, if it was a 12-story building, we created a 13th floor, called it roof, and then it, it treats them almost like they're rooms, but they were roofing sections. And so there, there can be um, data put in there, and we can extract it. So if, if originally it was generated in the GIS side, but we can export everything out of our GIS into a CAD format and run it the other way. So we're working on making that more transparent than it is and being able to switch this data back and forth without losing any kind of quality. And so that's kind of part of the fly in the ointment, as you say. No, that's great. Um, this question is from George Daly at Esri. He asks, impending retirement and data. Yeah, you noted in the abstract the immediate need for this data capture is driven by the fact that 55% of our facility staff will retire within the next five years. Can you speak a bit about the importance of being proactive around this sea change? Yeah, so when we, we started realizing that that's what's actually happening, we have people that have been engaged with our electrical systems or our utility systems for years 
we've moved our, our utility systems, you know, two, three times, just depending on, you know, what new building was getting put up or which one was being taken down. So there's so much history and knowledge in some of these people's heads that you don't want to lose that. Why did you make these changes? How did we do this? How did we do that? The irrigation system, where are all the blowout valves? Here in Canada, we have to blow out all our lines as we get closer to winter or they'll freeze and then we'll be replacing everything. So, you know, people have a lot of knowledge where this stuff is, but none of it was documented. Some of it was on paper, some of it was in CAD, but the CAD wasn't geo-referenced, so you go looking for it, it might not be in the right place. So we were struggling with a lot of that. So by capturing it and making the systems, we engaged all the workers and, and had them take these different units and say, oh, this is mine, this is my area, I'm proud, I'm going to make sure this is right. And so they would go around and they would find anything that was wrong. And that's really what our goal is, is, is we will build it, they will come and they will administrate it and then we will help them keep it running. And it's just been a great partnership between us and a lot of the different uh, units that work in our facilities. Well, that's fantastic. It shows. Um, Neil LaCour from UMass Lowell asks, how much of the uh, data visualization is um, done in Archibus versus GIS? Uh, literally none of it is done in, uh, in Archibus. So actually I can say none of it is done in Archibus. Everything that you saw here was all done in the GIS. And uh, Niels also, he wants to let you know, it's a very impressive system. Um, and then the question is, how do you get your annual aerial snapshots? Planes, drones, how do you do that? Well, in the, in the new technology of drones, that's hopefully what we've been trying to do. We, we actually own drones here at this university, but we can't get the regulatory approval to fly them because we're in the city and, and there's a privacy thing there. So we've been using aircraft, uh, private people that have uh, fly air photos and, and, and we buy them. We can buy them from our city as well, except for we like to fly at a much higher resolution. It means more work in the ortho rectification, but what we gain out of that is, is the same as you have, Michelle, with your your imagery where you start seeing things at six inches, you can find fire hydrants, you can find manholes, you can do your checking against your systems to make sure that your manholes are all lining up with your pipes and if not then you have to figure out why. Well excellent, excellent work. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up. We're, we're right on schedule so I know you were talking really fast to get all that wonderful information in. Um, Sorry. No, I thank you so much. I mean, you really, um, you really gave us a great presentation and a beautiful, you know, portrayal of the GIS uses at, at, at your university. So thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we'll go cool. ahead and wrap it up. Um, so I'd like to thank all the attendees who joined us today um, and remind them that the next webinar in the Geotech Showcase is scheduled for May 12th. Uh, Aaron Chevron will be presenting on facilities information spatial data model implementation at the University of Washington. And for more information on future webinars in this series, please visit the CFTA website at www.cfta.org. Thank you so much, Tom. You're welcome.